Susan Edwards Richmond is a poet who lives in Acton. She is poet in residence at Old Frog Pond Farm and Studio, where she organizes an annual plain air poetry event and posts a poem of the month on the farm's website. She also works at Mass Audubon Drum at Drumlin Farm, and she has been poet in residence and editor for a number of other nature-oriented and historic settings. Susan is also president of the Robert Creeley Poetry Foundation, which presents an annual award to nationally renowned poets, and also holds a statewide poetry contest for high school students. Susan is the author of four poetry collections and of the forthcoming picture book, Bird Count from Peachtree Publishers. Uh, so with that, I would like to invite Susan to come up and share some of her poetry with us. Please give her a big round of applause, Susan edwards um, Hi, I'd like to start by reading a poem from this new anthology from the Mass Audubon Society just came out. It's a member's publication, so if you're a member of Mass Audubon, um, you may have already received this. It's called The Quiet Earth, and it's got essays and poetry on the theme of nature and health. Um, this is a poem called Oxygen, which I wrote at Great Meadows, National Wildlife Refuge, refuge sitting right there. Um, it's, as Cheryl mentioned, I organize plein air poetry events, and that's a style of poetry that I've become very interested in these past few years of just sitting and writing in nature, being inspired by what comes and seeing where that impulse takes me. Oxygen. Eight egrets float on the marsh fringe, one, two, three at a time, rising, falling back into brush strokes. If I hadn't sat, I wouldn't have seen them. Or just now, the kingfisher, arrested in air, Heavy bills slightly parted, pointing down before the dive. The lilies overblown into alien pods, the cattails turning inside out their tufts of fur. I am convinced more than ever it is oxygen I need, the unadulterated air. But where? Last night we hurried in at dusk to shut up the house against the sprayer's poison. Out here, I still feel the crackle of an airway lapsed, the muscular gymnastics of long-term lime. But this morning creeps across the rail in the yellow jacket's bands, the swallowtail's buoyant refusal to light. Marsh wind blows my hair clean over acres and acres. It looks like you could walk from here to those egrets, but you can't. They are comfortable in distance. I want to tell you, but the words haven't been invented yet. Until you hear the buzzing in your own head, I tell you this instead. Um, the events that we do at Old Frog Pond Farm with Linda Hoffman and Lynn Horsky and so many poets from the region, including poets who are regulars here, Cheryl included. Cheryl's a frequent guest at the plein air readings and has had poems uh, published in our chat books that we do each year, as well as Terry House, who's here today, and Polly Brown, who I don't see in the audience, but I know many of you know her as well. Um, we invite poets from all over the region to come read at the farm, um, inspired by a particular theme, writing in plein air, and then we put together a chapbook and have a reading open to the public each fall. And I do have flyers in the back. Um, our reading this year is going to be on the afternoon on, of Sunday, September 11th at 2 o'clock p.m. And you are all invited to come and attend. This poem is called Beaverwood, Good Friday. And it's from last year's chapbook. A stump 18 inches wide, at least, not off. Imagine the effort, creatures pitching in from every side. At the crest, where the trunk finally ripped free, a tuft of wood twists and bristles like a spiky tail. The smooth grooves the incisors make amaze my fingertips. 
A song sparrow stutter leaps along its four notes springboard into staggered trill. From the farmhouse, the clear song of cardinal. And overhead, a blue jay sails in with singular warning. A leaning arm's length from the rock where I sit, a fresh beaver cut in sapling scatters shavings light and curly around the base. A chunk of feathered wood, precise in my hand, ridges like a pine cone or a grouse's fan tail. I am not one for marking time these days, but this work could be only hours old. How long would I need to stay to see beaver teeth scraping, gnawing a living? Today is the first day the sun has felt warm on my ungloved hands, my open neck, bare head, bowed above the page. Um, I do have a chapbook, Birding in Winter, which is back there if you want to take a look. Actually, I have some copies of Contours back there as well. I wanted to read a few poems from this. Um, Actually, I changed my program slightly after having a conversation just at the beginning um, before we got started this morning about woodpeckers with Owen. So um, I decided to read my poem, Ivory Bill, which as those of you who know about that controversy a few years ago, um, there are two camps. Do they still exist or are they extinct? You can see where I stand in this poem. Ivory Bill, I have followed you to the heart of the swamp moss tendrils, ringlets in my hair, damp, fetid earth, the sweet water, fragrant with decay. How will I know your wing flash? How will I know the sonorous crack of your bill seeking wood? You are the wings that guide me. Dark centers, a trailing ebullience of white, your steady rising flight. I am liquid in pursuit of you, Without voice, with voice only, you take me farther from the trail, past relic, step by step, to pitch in vine-tangled night, cultivate unslakable thirst, mangrove, tupelo, sweet gum, drowned oak, all the skeletons point inward, and always did. Um, I wanted to read two poems for my daughters. It's hard to believe my oldest daughter is graduating from college in a month, um, and the other will be graduating from college one year after. These poems are for them from a much younger stage. Um, this one is called Girl with Swallows for my older one, Alana, and it also was written at Great Meadows, a favorite spot of mine, Girl with Swallows. Sun stretches as day lowers its boom, black flies swirling. Having refused the hat, having refused the binoculars, she twirls behind a mother's purposeful steps. Everything about her, long and tapered and graceful. Having outgrown her youngest self, having outgrown her fledgling wings, she skips through blizzards of swallows skimming so close the swish of their sweep is like breath against skin and all the time the green backs catching the sun and all the time the white bellies mirroring the water the forked tails pinching off parcels of blue barn swallows reach down stir feathers in the pond tree swallows smoothly take the middle air while high above, swifts chitter and turn. Her heart plunges with every dive, soars with every mount to the sky. And this is Sandhill Crane for Sonia. This is on one of our trips to Florida um, at Mayaka State Park. Sandhill Crane. <clears throat> We were already leaving Mayaka when we saw it. The elegant four-foot bird stabbing the roadside grasses. Startlingly close, alert to us, erect, but nonchalant at the slowing of our vehicle, its rumbling stop. 
gazelle of birds, lifting long black legs, it stalked its prey, settling earth-colored plumage below its field mark rusty cap, strode right next to us, even when the car door opened and my eight-year-old daughter slipped free in red t-shirt, dusty gray shorts, and long tanned legs, toes splayed in sandals, stalking right behind. We were all quiet then, holding our breaths as she gained on it, picking her feet up high to clear the, the grasses. The bird allowed her to walk beside the girl's skin tingling with the thrill, matching steps, coming close enough to touch, but knowing in her wild instinct not to. I think I have time for like two more. This one is another trip that we took um, not too long ago to, well, maybe it was longer than I think, <laughs> but we went to the Southwest visiting national parks. This is called Zion, and it's for my husband, Jim, who is here at Wake Up for the first time. Yay. <laughs> Zion. In and out of air-conditioned sleep for hours. When you wake me, I remember I'm in Zion. At the crest of the canyon, night's silken shadow gives up its stars. Over jagged rock, a single flame wicks, licks granite, spills a few feet, then creeps along the rim. My gaze falls to the pieces of sky, newly blue, becoming earth below, then birds launching to the eaves, setting branches to sweep and flutter. It's chilly for the first time since we've been gone. You pull me closer on the bench where we sit. The light has crept a little closer, too, in its ragged silhouette, though we are blind to the opposite peaks behind, can only sense the sliding cascade of morning. And I'd like to end with this short poem, Dove. The waters have receded. What do I make of things now? Everything drawing back into itself. Everything back within its own borders and limits. Me back within my own borders and limits. The license of Noah, the freewheeling sanctioned journey, commerce with other species, other kinds, done. The olives I bring are a gift, the branch from the lines in the sand where all the free creatures gather now on trembling, expectant limbs, all of us who have survived the flood. Once there was a man who was born blind, and as he grew, he lived with his sister, and he would sit outside of her hut in the day, taking in the sun and the sounds that he heard. It was soon discovered that he was a very wise man, and people would come to him with questions and concerns, and he would listen carefully, and always the advice that he gave was the right advice. And people wondered at this man, who couldn't see, who lived in darkness, who understood everyone and everything. Finally, his sister became engaged to a hunter from another village, a very brave and brash hunter. So he came and lived with her in her hut, but so did her brother. And he had no time for this man who couldn't see. I mean, a hunter has to be able to see very clearly and sharply. He couldn't understand the point of someone who couldn't see, who lived in darkness. Well, many times the blind man would say to his brother-in-law, 
will you take me hunting sometime in the jungle? And it was all the hunter could do to keep from laughing at the thought of taking a blind man on a hunting expedition. Well, eventually after days, weeks, and months, the hunter had come home having killed a gazelle and he, his wife had cooked the food and uh, they had a great feast and he was feeling very jolly from whatever sort of alcoholic beverage they have in his village in West Africa. <laughs> and he said, tomorrow, brother-in-law, you can come with me on a hunting trip. So early the next morning, the two men left and they went into the jungle and they were walking. And as they were walking through a dense part of the jungle, suddenly the blind man said, stop, wait, listen. And the hunter stopped, surprised and listened and couldn't hear anything. And he said, what is it? And the blind man said, there's a lion just ahead on the right. And then the man said, I see nothing. He said, there is a lion, but it is all right. He's eating. He's got his kill. He's eaten and now he's sleeping, we can go safely by. Well, they walked a bit further and they did see the lion sleeping. Well, one of them saw it and one of them already knew. And they walked further and they came near a place where there was a water hole. And then the blind man said, stop, wait, there is a water buffalo. He may be coming out of the water soon and he's, he will know we're here and he could attack. So, the hunter being chastened by the blind man having known about a lion that he couldn't see himself, waited, and soon they heard the crashing sound of the water buffalo who crossed their path ahead of them and did not see them and did not smell them, so they were safe. Eventually they came to a place where the hunter said, we will set two traps, yours and mine, to catch a bird each and they stayed waiting a long time. And they slept in the forest, in the jungle. And in the morning, very early, the hunter and the blind man came and the hunter said there were two birds, one in each of these traps. And what the hunter could see was that in his own trap, there was a very plain gray bird. And in the blind man's trap, there was a beautiful silver, red and emerald green bird. But he took the plain gray bird out of his own trap and gave it to the blind man to take home. And he himself took the blind man's bird, the beautiful colored bird. As they were walking home, the hunter suddenly wanted to ask a question because he knew that many people thought that the blind man knew many things. He said, tell me, brother, why is it that there is so much hatred and war in the world? And the blind man softly said, because there are so many people who want to take what is not theirs by any means. Well, this struck the heart of the hunter very strongly and he realized that what he'd done was wrong. He said, brother, I've taken your bird. Here, let me give you the bird that your trap caught, which is a beautiful bird of many colors. And let me take the bird that my trap caught, which was a plain gray bird. And as they continued to walk through the jungle back to the hut where the blind man's sister lived, where the hunter's wife lived, he said, tell me, brother, how is it that there is so much goodness in the world? And the blind man softly said, well, it is because people are like you and they learn by their mistakes. Many of them do. When they got back to the hut, they continued to live, the three of them together, and the blind man would still sit on his bench outside the hut during the day and the sitting in the sun and listening to the world go by, and people would come. Some would say to the hunter who was from his own village, how can you befriend this man who lives in darkness? He cannot see at all. Ah, said the hunter, he may not see with his eyes, but he sees with his ears and with his heart. Thank you. If I had wings like Noah's dove, I'd fly. 
high up the river to the one I love. Fare thee well, oh honey. I have drunk alabaster sitting beside the wormhole ancient stone and water fallen over rocks cascading in a timeless folded stream beside the water's swirl. This giant layered rock in split and seamed, creased, cracked and pocked, water eaten till a city's endless towered steps of human structuring grow small and dwindle by its side. These sea stone cities are more strong, more rich, as veined and numinous as dead wood under weather or pulsing human flesh. These too shall pass, yet in the passing be transmuted 
mute as stone into some other vein of silent speaking life. For life goes on, no matter what the loss. The past is present, and the future comes to be as silently as stone grown out of fire or the ocean's moonstone depth. To sit and dream, to sit and read, to sit and learn about the world outside our world of here and now, our problem world. To dream of vast horizons of the soul through dreams made whole, unfettered, free, help me, all you who are dreamers too, help me to make our world anew. I reach out my dreams to you. Peepers, cold-blooded frogs in water, hope in damp darkness, April's ancient mystery. Change comes quickly in April. I want one hour back. Listen how the rain drenches with a clink in the gutter. Morning doves coo me awake. Soon sun heats the seedlings. Wet shine of time everywhere. No time to lament. Thank you.